have a doubt. What is it, Jim? Have you heard of Saint Teresa? You mean Saint Teresa of Calcutta? Yes. Was she born in India? Hmm. I don't think so. I think she was born outside India, and she eventually settled down here. Do you know where she was born? Hmm. I can't remember, Jim. We lost Uncle Francis. He must be on his way here. That must be him, Uncle Francis. Ha <laughs> ha! Good evening, Jim. Good evening, Uncle. Where is Joan? Good evening, Uncle. Good evening, Joan. Hey, listen. Have you finished all your homework today? Yes, Uncle. Why did you ask? That's good. I was thinking maybe we could go out for a walk today. The weather is so nice today. That's a great idea, Uncle. Let me go and tell Mom that we're going outside. Look at this one. <laughs> He is looking so happy. Hmm. <laughs> yes, Uncle. Jim was asking me if Saint Teresa was born in India or not. And what did you say? I knew that she was not born in India. Where was she actually born, Uncle? Hmm. I'll say that. But do you want to hear the full story of Saint Teresa of Calcutta? Yes, I do. Then why don't you call Jim as well? Jim, come here. Huh? Uncle is going to tell us the story of Mother Teresa. Story of Mother Teresa? I'm coming. Mother Teresa was born on August 26, 1910. She was born in a little town called Skopje, which is in the modern-day Macedonia. Her father, Nikola, was a successful businessman, and her mother was Drana, a housewife. We are going to call you Agnes. Agnes, what a wonderful name! As a little girl, Agnes was a very disciplined, thoughtful little girl who didn't seem to mind helping her brother and sister. She was apparently shy and introverted as well. What do we have for lunch, Mom? We are having roast pork today. There you go, just as you like it. And here is a special bread for you, Agnes. Yes, Father. Haven't I told you before to not accept a mouthful unless it's shared with others? I'm sorry, Father. You can have some of this bread, Sister. It's really tasty. Thank you, Agnes. And here is one for you, Brother. <laughs> Thank you, Agnes. You're always so kind. But the happiness didn't last for long. When Agnes was nine, her father got sick and he died. This left the entire burden of supporting the family on her mother. In spite of the difficulties, Drana ensured that her children attended the private elementary school and then the religious instruction at the Sacred Heart Church. Her mother's charitable nature, the daily prayers, the frequent visits to the church, which was next door, and the summer pilgrimage to Let Nice. All these must have nurtured the desire to serve God in the mind of little Agnes. Hello, Agnes. Where have you been, Father? I haven't seen you for so long. <laughs> I had been to Calcutta, dear. Huh? Where is this Calcutta? It's in India. It's a very beautiful place. Hmm. Look, Father. I was able to raise some money from our people. Please take this. You can use it for your missionary work. Oh, that's so kind of you, Agnes. May God bless you. Father? Yes, Agnes. How can you know when the Lord is calling you into some vocation? Hmm, that's a very good question. I think you will know it by the happiness you feel. Ah. By the time Agnes turned 17, she sensed God's call upon her. She had just returned from a missionary work in Let Nice, and by the time she reached back home, she knew what she had to do. Mother? Yes, dear. I have to tell you something. 
What is it? When Agnes told her mother of her intentions to become a nun, Durana went immediately into her room and stayed there for 24 hours. She was pouring her heart out to God. And when she finally came out of the room, her emotions were under control. Mother, what were you doing inside all this time? I... I was quite worried. Don't worry, dear. I had to let out all my feelings. This profession that you have chosen is going to take you away from me. Oh, mother. Don't worry, dear. Now you must put your hand in his hand and walk all the way with him. I will, mother. Thank you so much. Agnes joined a Catholic order called the Sisters of Laredo and she was going to India like she had always wanted. She left Skopje on 25th December, 1928. Goodbye, my child. What they didn't know was that they were never going to meet again in this life. Agnes formally became a novice in the Sisters of Laredo and took the name Maria Teresa. She initially worked in a hospital in Bengal and then worked as a teacher in a girls' school in Calcutta. Teacher! Yes, dear. I... I brought this for you. Well, thank you so much, dear. Teresa loved teaching from the start. She soon became the favorite of her students as well. Here, take this bread too. No, sister. You have eaten nothing. I know you're hungry. No, I'm not hungry at all. Do I look like I'm hungry? No, I don't want that. Hello there. Good afternoon, teacher. Good afternoon. Now tell me, why are you refusing to eat the food? That's... that's because... Go on, tell me. We don't have enough food at home. Our mother could only get two slices of bread today. And my sister? She wants me to eat both of them. She... I know she's hungry. But she won't have them. Oh, is it true, dear? Hmm. Yes, teacher. My brother is sick. And the other day, when the doctor came to check on him, I heard him saying that he has to eat three times a day. That's why I was offering him my share of food as well. That is so kind of you, my child. Now come with me. Eat well, my dears. Thank you, miss. Sister Teresa? Yes, Mother Superior? Come here for a moment. Yes? Why did you offer your food to these kids? They are going to make this a habit, you know. I don't know, Mother. Sometimes I feel we have a lot more privileges than we are supposed to have. Look at these kids. They don't have food to eat. And what are we doing about it? You should stop worrying about unwanted things, Teresa. I know, but I just can't stop thinking about it. It was not long after that Teresa found her real calling. She was aboard a train traveling to Darjeeling when Teresa clearly heard the call that transformed her life. <music> Teresa's superiors were shocked when she told them of her intentions to leave the convent. However, they had much respect for Teresa and they got special permission allowing her to leave the convent. I don't think if that's the right thing to do, Teresa. We are worried about you. This is the God's will, Mother. I know what I have to do. Hmm. Anyway, whatever happens, you know the doors of this institution will be always open for you. Thank you, Mother. Teresa got trained in healthcare and she started her work in the poor slums of Calcutta. She realized that the first thing to do was to take care of their health. 
she started giving free medical treatments wherever she found them. But the money quickly ran out, and she was soon left with a few coins. Sister, oh hello there. How are you today? Sister, can you please help me? What happened, dear? What do you want? I haven't eaten anything since yesterday. Can you give me a few coins to buy some food? Of course, dear. Now come with me. Good evening, sister. What do you want? Good evening, sir. Can you give this boy some rice and curry? To this boy? Do you have any money? I I don't worry. I will pay for his food. How much is it? But well, why do you want to help him? He is of no concern to you. He is a child of God, and that is definitely of my concern. Here you go. You have a great mind to help others, sister. May God bless you. Can you please make a donation, sister? Oh, hello. <laughs> Looks like that's all what I have. Do you have any money left for you? Oh, don't worry. A father will take care of me. Which order do you belong to, sister? I cannot recognize by the sari that you are wearing. I am Sister Teresa and I am a missionary. It's a pleasure to meet you, sister. I am Father Julian. You You look like you're upset, sister. Is there some way that I can help you? Oh, it's just that I was thinking of ways for helping the poor. But don't worry. God will show me some way. Hmm. Looks like it's going to be a tough road ahead. I know. Don't worry, sister. I will pray for you every day and I will come to see you whenever possible. Good luck, sister. Thank you so much. She had no sources of medicine when she started. So she would walk down into a pharmacy with a list of medicines she needed. She would wait for hours till their customers were attended. and then she would present the list to the manager with a great smile good evening sir good evening sister what can i do for you how about doing something beautiful for god today huh it was her pleasant and cheerful character that made many of the pharmacists give her the medicine she needed for free sister teresa had to struggle a lot to find the money she needed With whatever resources she had, she helped the poor tirelessly day and night. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling good, sister. Thank you for all what you did, sister. We don't know what we would have done if you weren't there to help us. I did what I had to do. It was nothing. Even the doctors were refusing to help us. They don't care about treating the poor. I would have lost my child if it weren't for you. Don't thank me. Thank God. Sister Teresa. Father Julian, how are you? It's so hard to find you, sister. One day you are in one place and the next you are gone. <laughs> I have to attend to many people's needs, father. I know. You have such a wonderful heart. And maybe that's why a friend of mine gave you this. What is this, father? Go on. Open it and see for yourself. Ha! A check? But how? Who gave this, father? <laughs> I spoke to one of my friend about your work, and he's really impressed with what you are doing. He gave this money to help you with your charity works. Thank you, Father Julian. You have no idea how many people are going to get benefited from this money. Thank you so much. In February 1949, a former student of Sister Teresa named Shubhashini, a Bengali girl from a prosperous family, joined her ministry. Good morning, Mother. Good morning. Hey, Shubhashini. It's you. It's been such a long time. I'm doing good, mother. How have you been? I'm doing all right by the grace of God. Tell me, 
Why are you here? Sister, I have always wanted to help the poor and needy. I know that's my calling in this life. Can you please allow me to join your ministry? That's wonderful, dear. But are your parents okay with that? Yes, mother. I have convinced them and they are fine now. Mm, then come with me, child. Like that, one by one, many joined the ministry of Teresa. By the end of the year, Sister Teresa's ministry had 10 members. All of them had the same motive, to serve the poorest of the poor in society. None of them received any payments for their services, and their sole personal wealth consisted of two saris, some personal belongings, and a prayer book. The disciples followed a disciplined way of life. They were up very early in the morning for prayer and mass. Then they had a simple breakfast of chapati and tea. They would be out in the slums by morning, servicing the needy. They returned for their meal, which again consisted of simple rice and dal curry. They would pray and rest for some time, and then again head back to work until evening. They prayed again before supper and more prayers after supper, and then they would go to sleep around 10 p.m. Sister Teresa, who was now called Mother Teresa by everyone, also charted a constitution for the new Society of the Missionaries of Charity. To fulfill our mission of compassion and love to the poorest of the poor, we go seeking out in towns and villages. We must search for the sick, the infirm, the lepers, the lost and the outcast. We must go and take care of them, offer them help, visit them often, awaken them to the love of greater God. The missionaries of charity expanded their work into more than 20 cities in India. By the 1960s, the world opened its doors to Mother Teresa. The Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to Mother Teresa in 1979. By then, the Missionaries of Charity had opened 61 new houses in 28 countries other than India. Look, she's not even wearing a shoes. Before beginning my speech today, I would like to invite all of you to pray. to say I love God, but I do not love my neighbor. It is very important to realize that love, if it is really love, must hurt. I have never heard anyone talk about love that way. Look at her. She doesn't even have to utter a single word. Her presence is more than enough. And one day, Mother Teresa was invited to meet Pope John Paul II. Mother Teresa was filled with joy as she always wanted to meet the Pope for a very long time. Good morning, Mother. Good morning, my child. Has the Pope arrived? Yes, Mother. He's waiting for you over there. Let me go to him then. We have so much to discuss and so much work to do. Mother Teresa, you have become a very important public figure. <laughs> yes, winning the Nobel Prize means that the people appreciate my work. But you know, I am doing this only to glorify our God. I understand, Mother. I am a big fan of yours too and I am happy that your fame is growing. <laughs> my fame can grow much more. It won't fit in such a small habit. Ha ha ha. I wish many people had your strength and your smile. This world would become a much better place. Thank you, Your Holiness. Mother Teresa breathed her last on 5th September 1997. She was granted a state funeral by the Indian government in gratitude for her services to the poor. And at the time of her death, 
Mother Teresa's missionaries of charity had over 4,000 sisters and an associated brotherhood of 300 members operating 610 missions in 123 countries. Wow! The missionary had grown so big! Yes, Joan. Uncle, what can you tell us about the miracles Mother Teresa had performed? Hmm. There were two miracles that were recognized by the Vatican that led the way to her sainthood. I will tell you about one of them. <laughs> In 1997, a tribal woman named Monica was diagnosed with a tumor in her stomach. There's nothing left to do now. I don't think we can find a cure for her. Oh no, please don't say like that. Please help her doctor. Please do something. Please be calm. It's an abdominal tumor and there's no way that we can save her. Oh God, what should I do now? Please save my wife. Hey. Yes, sister? Listen, I know about your wife's illness. There's nothing that the hospitals and the doctors can do now. That's what they just told me. Tell me what to do, sister. I'll do anything to save her. There's God who's looking after all of us. Why don't you take her to the missionaries of charity and pray for her cure? Huh? After having visited a number of hospitals and countless doctors, Monica was then admitted to a home run by the missionaries of charity in the town of Patiram. Don't worry, my child. We are witnessing the first death anniversary of Mother Teresa with prayers in the chapel. Be strong and pray to God. I'm sure he will help you. Thank you, sister. On September 5th, 1998, while others were praying in the chapel, Monica too joined the prayers lying on her bed. Lord my God, please help me. That's when she saw a beam of light emanating from the photograph of Mother Teresa. Huh? Huh? <laughs> in the evening, two sisters of the order tied a medallion with Mother Teresa's picture around the waist of Monica. And then they prayed over her. After many months of uncontrollable pain and suffering, Monica was finally able to sleep peacefully that night. And when she woke up in the morning, her tumor was gone. <laughs> what? But how? It's a miracle. <laughs> Thank you, God. Wow, that was a great miracle. Yes, Jim, there were other miracles that took place too, which include the recovery of Marcilio Haddad, a Brazilian. Mother Teresa was canonized a saint in 2016 after verifying the miracles by the Vatican. That was a great story, Uncle. Thanks for telling us. It was my pleasure. Come on, it's getting late. Let's go back home. everyone. Today we are going to learn the story of Saint Lucy, also known as Lucia of Syracuse. She is one of the most highly venerated saints in Christianity and one of only eight women mentioned by name in the Roman Catholic Mass. Lucy was born in 283 to wealthy Roman parents in the area of Syracuse. Her father was a Roman nobleman, and he was very rich. Her mother, Eutychia, had Greek origins. 
She... She is so beautiful. I hope she makes us proud one day. Her parents loved her very much, and they lived a happy life together. This world, it is so wonderful. Hello, little one. Lucia, where are you? It's lunchtime. Coming, mother. But the happiness did not last for long. When Lucy was five years old, her father died leaving the young girl and her mother to fend for themselves. Lucy embraced Christianity from a very young age. We don't know what actually inspired her to become a Christian, but she was faithful to the Lord as any true Christian is. It was quite challenging, if not dangerous, to be a Christian during those days. The Romans punished the followers of Christ severely as it was considered to be a crime. The Christians had to worship secretly and away from the eyes of Roman soldiers. Lucy knew this, so she kept her faith unknown to anyone, even from her own mother. She had hopes of being able to lead a celibate life and help the poor and needy people. Hello. Yeah. What do you want? I just want to help you. How are you doing today, sir? How do I look like I'm doing? I don't have a place to stay. I'm starving. I haven't eaten in two days. I'm sorry to hear that, sir. Please take this money. This is all that I can do for you at the moment. Huh? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I shouldn't have been so rude to you. You are such a kind woman. Thank you, sir. I hope that I can help you even more someday. Have a good day, dear. As a young girl, she knew that she would be expected to marry and that there was a dowry set aside for her. She secretly hoped to give away the money to the poor someday. Her mother, Utisha, was not keeping well as she was suffering from an unknown health disorder. She was either unaware of her daughter's vow or was concerned for her future as a single woman. She worried that she might die soon, so she arranged a marriage for Lucy. Please, my child, I don't think I have much time to live now. I want to see you married and safe with someone before I leave this world. Okay, mother, I will do whatever you say. Utisha arranged a marriage for Lucy, betrothing her to a young man from a wealthy pagan family. Lucy knew her mother could not be swayed by a young girl's vow, so she devised a plan to convince her mother that Christ was the better partner for life. Mother, I have obeyed you all my life. I even got engaged when I didn't feel it was right. I want you to listen to me just this once. What is it, dear? What do you want me to do? I want you to come with me to the shrine of St. Agatha tomorrow. We shall pray for your health, and then, then you will see what miracles my Lord can perform. But. Please don't say no, Mother. Just listen to me this once. I want you to live a long life. Please say yes, Mother. Hmm. Okay, dear. I will come with you to the shrine. The next day, Lucy took her mother to the St. Agatha's Shrine. Once they reached the shrine, they prayed there all night. After a few hours, They both fell asleep of exhaustion near the tomb of St. Agatha. It was then that Lucy got a vision. Huh? Where am I? Am I dreaming? St. Agatha? Is it... is it really you? St. Agatha 
had appeared to Lucy in a dream and gave her the good news that her mother was healed. St. Agatha further informed Lucy that she will be the glory of Syracuse, the city where St. Lucy lived. Was it all just a dream? Mother, mother, wake up. What, what happened, Lucia? Mother, you won't believe what just happened. I had a vision of St. Agatha, and she said, she said that you have been cured. What? Huh? I feel, I feel no pain at all. This is, this is a miracle. Yes, Mother, didn't I tell you that St. Agatha would help us? Now look at what happened. You were right, my child. Your way of life is indeed the right one. Thank you. Thank you, God, for saving me. It was a miracle indeed. Lucy's mother was convinced that day, and she too got converted to Christianity. When they reached back home, Lucy asked her mother for permission to distribute their wealth among the poor. Eutisha tried to convince Lucy to give the riches away in her will rather than right away. She was concerned about how her daughter will survive. Mother, true charity means giving the riches away while I am still alive, not when I am dead and have no further use of them. Her mother agreed, and they started distributing their wealth among the poor and needy. News that the patrimony and jewels were being distributed came to Lucy's betrothed, and this made him very angry. He denounced her to the governor of Syracuse, who was an evil man named Pashasius. He told the governor about her faith in Christianity as well. What? How could a woman do something like that? Bring her to me now. The soldiers soon brought Lucy to his court, and the trial began. I heard you've become a Christian. Don't you know it's a crime? Do you have anything to say about this? Yes, I am, and I am true to my faith, sir. No matter what you do to my body, my soul will remain pure. How dare you speak to me like that? Do you want to be punished like the others? I will give you one last chance. You must make a sacrifice to the idols, the idols of true God, and announce your faith in front of everyone here. You can do this, and I will set you free. I am sorry, sir. I cannot do that. I will only make sacrifice to Lord Christ through my good deeds. Huh? You are such a fool. God, take her away. You are hereby sentenced to be taken to a brothel and insulted in public. Take her away now. No matter what you do to my books, my soul will remain pure. How dare you speak out like that? Ah! Come on, get up. Get up, I say. Don't waste my time. Drag her to the brothel. Yes, my lord. Come on. Hey, you, help me. Little did they realize that the Holy Spirit had made her body heavy and immobile. It had become impossible to lift. Soon, many others joined, but they too failed to move her. Pashasius even ordered a team of oxen to help them, but that too failed. How could it be? How are you so strong? You will not believe me even if I tell you the truth. My strength comes from none other than Jesus, my Lord and God. Huh? We will see about that. Guards, tie her to the stake and burn her. 
Let's see if her god will help her. Lucy was then tied to a stake with bundles of wood piled up all around her. But when the guard tried to light the fire, they simply wouldn't burn. A huge crowd soon gathered around the site of prosecution. They were all witnessing the power of God, and they were stunned. Pashasius is tormented as he could not find a way to kill her. He couldn't stand her looking at him and smiling either. Gods, tear her eyes out and then strike her. The guards, as commanded, tore her eyes off and struck her. But even after that, Lucy continued to pray to God, and she spoke to the crowd, announcing to them that the peace of the church will soon follow after the end of Diocletian's reign and Maximian's death. The guards struck her again, and eventually Lucy met her death. Lucy's legend did not end with her death. Pretty soon, as she prophesied, Pashasius was soon arrested and killed for plundering the city and for other illegal crimes he committed during his tenure. When Lucy's body was prepared for burial in the family mausoleum, it was discovered that her eyes had been miraculously restored. This is one of the reasons that Lucy is the patron saint of eye illnesses. Lucy whose name can mean light or lucid, is the patron saint of the blind. She is often seen with the emblem of eyes on a cup or plate. In paintings, she is often depicted with a golden plate holding her eyes and often holds a palm branch, which is a symbol of victory over evil. April 27th, the Catholic Church honors Saint Zita, a 13th century Italian woman whose humble and patient service to God has made her a patron saint of maids and other domestic workers. Let us learn her amazing story today. Zita was born at Monsagrati, a village near Lucca, Italy, at the beginning of the 13th century. Her parents were poor, devout Christians. Her mother raised her in the love and fear of the Lord. Her uncle Graziano was a hermit whom the local people regarded as a saint. Her older sister soon left home and became a Cistercian nun. By the time she turned 12, Zita had already developed a strong prayer life. The peasant girl had to soon find a job as a means to support her family. Soon, she started working as a servant in the house of the wealthy Fatinelli family in Lucha. Zita's employers lived near a church where she managed. Each morning, she would wake up early and pray before attending Mass. She became quite popular for her sunny demeanor and hard work. She carried out her household duties so perfectly that the other servants thought she was trying to shame them. They became very jealous of her and were mean to her at every opportunity. Her presence in the Fadinelli household, however, was inexplicably unwelcome and met with harsh treatment for a number of years. Zita suffered hostility and abuse from her employers including fits of rage, and sometimes they beat her too. She faced this abuse with patience and inner strength from prayer. She gave away the good food she received for herself and gave it to the many hungry beggars who came looking for help. She mostly ate leftovers or fasted. When her employers came to know about this, they were upset. 
One day, as she was carrying the bread to the gates, folded in her apron, Signor Fatinelli arrived. When he pulled open her apron, instead of bread, only flowers fell to the ground. This was a miracle. One day, when he found that Zita had given away the entire store of dried beans from the pantry, he dragged her into the pantry to show her what she had done. When they got to the pantry, the master was shocked. The full store of the dried beans was replenished. In another instance, Zita left her chore of baking bread to tend to someone in need. The servants made sure the Fatinelli family was aware of what happened. They went to investigate immediately. When they arrived, they found angels in the kitchen baking the bread for her. In time, the Fatinelli family were completely won over by the patience and goodness of Zita. They came to value her service and appreciate the virtues she had acquired through God's grace. Zita was soon promoted to the head housekeeper and was given a free reign over her working schedule. In her new household role, Zita was faithful to Christ's admonition that superiors should conduct themselves as the servants of all. She treated her co-workers as her equal with respect. She looked upon her work primarily as a means of serving God and kept herself mindful of His presence during long hours of exhausting tasks. She also continued with her visits to the sick and those in prison. In her charity, she was also known to exercise prudence, giving aid to only those who truly needed it. Word spread rapidly in Lucha of her good deeds and the heavenly visions that appeared to her. Throughout her life, Zita found a source of strength in the Mass and Communion, which frequently moved her to tears. Her advice was often sought by the officials in Lucha, and she was always happy to help them. As things turned out, she stayed with the Fatinelli family for 48 years of her life. After foretelling her own death and preparing spiritually, Zita died in Lucha on April 27, 1271. After her death, numerous miracles were wrought at her intercession so that she came to be venerated as a saint in the neighborhood of Lucha. The Fatinelli family, which had once caused St. Zita such extreme suffering, eventually contributed to the cause of her canonization. The earliest account of her life was found in a manuscript belonging to the family and published in 1688. Pope Innocent XII canonized Zita in 1696. Saint Zita, inspire us to take pride in our daily work and do it to the best of our abilities out of love for God. May we find Jesus in the most menial of tasks. May we always embrace a spirit of obedience and charity as you did. Pray for us, Saint Zita, that we may have a generous heart that gives even when we have little. Place a trust in Jesus deep in our heart that we may never experience despair or loss of hope. Please carry the petitions we hold in our heart to Jesus on our behalf. Amen. A long time ago, there lived a well-respected couple in Rocca Purana named Antonio and Amata Lodi. They were the village peacemakers who helped everyone in the town of Rocca Purana get along. 
When there was a disagreement, Rita's parents helped people discuss the problem to reach agreements and forgive one another. Rita was born in the year 1381. Her parents, Antonio and Amata Lodi, considered her birth a very special gift from God, for Rita was born to them as they were already advancing in age. She was named Margarita. In the local dialect, her name meant Pearl, but she was simply known as Rita. Rita's parents were very wise, and Rita learned the importance of pardon and reconciliation from them. As a young girl, Rita frequently visited the covenant of the Augustinian nuns in Caskia and dreamed of one day joining their community. Hello, friend. How are you doing today? One of her favorite places to go was the Church of St. Augustine, where she would pray to God and to all the saints that she called her friends. Rita's three favorite saints were St. Augustine of Hippo, St. John the Baptist, and St. Nicholas of Tolentine. But her parents had different plans. Her parents, however, had promised her in marriage, according to the custom of the day, to Paolo Mancini, a good man of strong and impetuous character. Rita, being an obedient daughter, agreed to her parents' decision and married Paolo. Together, Paolo and Rita had two sons. Rita was a good wife and a loving mother, and together the family lived a simple life of faith and love. In the troubling political climate of the times, there was often open conflict between families. Paolo was the victim of one such conflict, and he was murdered when their sons were still young. Rita was very sad and knew what had happened. Paolo's family had been fighting with another family for a long time, and every once in a while, someone would get hurt or even killed. The families refused to forgive one another. Instead, they kept hurting one another and then would seek revenge. You should never let them sleep peacefully, boy. You must avenge your father's death. The society at the time expected that the boys should avenge the murder of their father to defend family honor. Rita, however, influenced by the peacemaking example of her parents, pledged to forgive her husband's killers. You have to forgive them. You must let it go. Otherwise, there will be no peace. But Rita's two teenage sons did not feel very forgiving. They wanted to get even. Now, at the same time all this was happening, there was a severe illness sweeping through that area of Italy, making many people sick and die. Before Rita's sons could seek revenge on their father's murderers, both of them got very ill and died. Despite her great burden, she could still thank God. Thank you, God, for they have died in peace, free of the poison of murder. They were getting drawn to hatred and revenge, which would have soon consumed them. Now alone in the world and without family responsibilities, Rita once more turned her thoughts to the desired vocation of her youth that of joining the Augustinian nuns of St. Mary Magdalene Monastery. She went to the convent in Caskia and asked to join the nuns there. Sister, it has been my wish since I was a child to join this convent. Please let me in. But the sisters at St. Mary Magdalene Monastery were hesitant and refused her request. Although the nuns liked Rita and knew how faithful and forgiving she was, they also knew about Paolo's death. They knew that Paolo's family and the family responsible for his death had not forgiven each other, and they were still fighting. 
The nuns feared that if Rita entered their convent, these families will somehow follow her and hurt the convent. Disheartened, she implored her three patron saints, John the Baptist, Augustine, and Nicholas of Tolentino to assist her, and that's when she realized what she must do. I have to make peace. She went to her husband's family and exhorted them to put aside their hostility and stubbornness. They were convinced by her courage and agreed. Rita went to the family who had murdered her husband and told them the same thing. It is time for peace. The rival family, astounded by this overture of peace and by the suffering she had endured, the family agreed. Rita was successful in establishing peace between two hostile families for tens of generations. She had achieved the impossible. She was finally allowed entry into the monastery. At the age of 36, Rita pledged to follow the ancient rule of St. Augustine. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for giving me the chance to serve you. Even while staying in the covenant, she put her peacemaking skills to good use. She was frequently visited by people from town who needed help forgiving one another. For the next 40 years, she gave herself wholeheartedly to prayer and works of charity. The poor and needy often visited her, and she would never turn them away. For 40 years, she lived a regular life of prayer, contemplation, and spiritual reading, according to the rule of St. Augustine. One good Friday, Rita was deep in prayer. She was thinking about Jesus' suffering on the cross. Because she was such a kind and generous person, Rita told Jesus of her greatest wish. Oh, Jesus, how I wish I could ease some of the pain you experience on the cross. She prayed this with such pure love and she wanted more and more to intimately join the suffering of Jesus. This desire of hers was satisfied in an extraordinary way. Suddenly, a small wound appeared on her forehead, as though a thorn from the crown that encircled Christ's head had loosed itself and penetrated her own flesh. The stigmata remained on Rita's head for the rest of her life a sign that Jesus had recognized her great love for him and accepted her offer by allowing her to carry one of the signs of his passion. For the next 15 years, she bore this external sign of stigmatization and union with the Lord. In spite of the pain she constantly experienced, she offered herself courageously for the physical and spiritual well-being of others. Rita was confined to bed during the last four years of her life. She was able to eat so little that she was practically sustained on the Eucharist alone. The nuns in the monastery were greatly moved by her faith in Jesus, and they looked up to her. Toward the end of her life, Rita progressively weakened physically. Several months before her death, she was visited by a relative from Rocco Perena who asked if there was anything she could do for the ailing woman. Rita at first declined, but then made a simple request. Bring me a rose from my garden. But that was impossible. It was January in Caskia, and snow covered the hills for miles around. No roses could bloom in that snow. Nevertheless, on returning home, the woman discovered, to her amazement, a single brightly colored blossom on the bush where the nun said it would exactly be. 
she picked the flower and ran back to the convent. Rita knew this rose was a sign from God that her many years of prayer for her sons and her husband had been answered and that she would see them in heaven again soon. She breathed her last. Rita's final words to the sisters who gathered around her were, Remain in the holy love of Jesus. Remain in obedience to the holy Roman Church. Remain in peace and fraternal charity. Rita died peacefully on May 22, 1457. The bells of the convent immediately began to ring, untouched by human hands, calling the people of Kaskia to the doors of the convent and to announce the triumphant completion of a life faithfully lived. As the nuns prepared her for the final burial, a carpenter, paralyzed by a stroke, wished, If only I were well, I would have prepared a coffin worthy of you. <laughs> it was then that the first miracle happened. The carpenter was healed completely as soon as he said those words. He was overjoyed and ran to the convent. The people who knew him were shocked to see him running toward them. It's a miracle! I am healed! He then made an elaborate and richly decorated coffin that would preserve Rita's remains for centuries. It is still incorrupt today, now in a glass-enclosed coffin in the Basilica of Kaskia. Her feast is observed on the anniversary of her death, 22 May. Pray for us, O holy Saint Rita, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Amen. Is it true that our neighbor's son, John, got first rank? Yes, Jim. Look at the newspaper. Even his photo got published. Wow! I saw a lot of visitors arriving at his home and congratulating him for his great achievement. Well, it's not a surprise, you know. Huh? Why? Both his parents are doctors. They were training him for a long time for this entrance exam. Oh! Then there is no surprise, as you said. Hmm, but why do the parents want their children to follow them? Some parents are like that, Jim. But we should be thanking God that our parents are not like that. Yeah, we should. Can I ask you something? What is it? See, we have been listening to the stories of saints. Is there any saint whose parents were also a saint? Hmm, do you remember the story of Augustine of Hippo? His mother. Monica was also a saint. That's right. Do you know of anyone else? Oh, no. I have no idea about that, Jim. We will ask Uncle Francis when he comes today. Good morning, children. Good morning, Uncle Francis. Now, whose story do you want to hear today? Uncle, was there any other saint whose parents were also declared saints? Well, there was Saint Augustine of Hippo. I told him that. But is there anyone else like that, Uncle Francis? Of course, Jim. Hmm. Parents of Mother Mary. Joachim and Anna were also saints. Anyone else, Uncle Francis? Yes, the parents of Saint Teresa of Lisieux, popularly known as the Little Flower, are also saints. Saint Teresa of Lisieux? Can you narrate her story today, Uncle? All right. Now listen carefully. Teresa was born in France in 1873. 
the pampered daughter of a mother who wanted to be a saint and a father who had wanted to be a monk. The two had gotten married, but determined they would be celibate until a priest told them that was not how God wanted a marriage to work. They must have followed his advice very well because they had nine children. The five children who survived were all daughters. Zeli, what should I do? This deadly disease has claimed the life of four of our children. Hmm. Let the nurse Rose look after her. She took good care of Leonie and Celine when they were kids. But Rose has her own children to be looked after. How will she stay away from her kids? Dear, let us send Teresa to her home. I'm sure she'll take good care of her. Hmm. I agree with you. She has always been such a great nurse. Teresa was handed over to the care of Rose Taye, and for 15 months she was taken care of by this nurse. But in the meantime, her mother was desperately fighting the cancer. Louise, my daughters, I think I think that my time on earth is about to come to an end. Mother, what are you saying? Teresa, mom is sick and she's dying. What? But but Pauline? Yes, mother. You should take good care of Teresa. She's still a child. I'm sure Leonie and Celine can manage themselves. Teresa's 16-year-old sister, Pauline, now became her second mother. Pauline took good care of Teresa and both of them became quite inseparable. Sister, please don't leave. Hmm. Don't cry, Teresa. God will look after you. I will miss you. I will miss you too, dear. Don't forget to pray every day. In a few months, Teresa got ill and she was bedridden. She's going to die, you know. Oh, shut up. How can you speak like that in front of a little girl? Hmm. Hmm. Where? Where is Mary? Oh, she's there praying to Mother Mary. My dear, listen to me. You should start praying to Mother Mary and all your troubles will go away. Is it true? Of course it is. I know so many people who got cured after they prayed to Mother Mary. Teresa saw her sisters praying to Mother Mary. She too started praying to Our Lady. The, the little girl, girl as usual, was praying, praying to, to Mother, Mother Mary, Mary that night. night. Oh, Mother Mary, please heal me. It was then that she saw Mother Mary smiling in front of her. Huh? Am I dreaming? As soon as the vision disappeared, Teresa was able to sit upright and she was completely healed. Father, father. What? What happened? Look, father, I'm all right now. Huh? It's true? You're healed? <laughs> How did this happen? I was praying to Mother Mary and it was she who healed me. <laughs> You're so innocent. It's true, father. She just appeared before me and she smiled at me. What? Are you are you sure? Yes, father. Huh. <sighs> Thank you, God. Teresa was the pampered little girl in their household, and she always started crying for even simple reasons. Teresa, come on. Why are you sitting alone and crying? Miss, my classmates keep making fun of me. Oh, that's part of school life, dear. You should take things in the right spirit. How else are you going to enjoy your school life? I'm coming here only because my sisters are in school. Teresa had all the tantrums of a young girl. She always had an outburst of emotions, and that made her different from other children. After a few years, her sisters, Marie and Leonie, also joined the convent. This made little Teresa also think about joining the convent. But she knew that she wouldn't be able to handle the rigors of the Carmelite life as long as she couldn't handle her own emotional outbursts. Uncle Francis, how did she overcome this weakness? She describes that in her Story of a Soul about this great conversion on a Christmas day. Uncle Francis, 
Is that book her autobiography? Yes, it is in fact a collection of the letters she had written and published by her elder sister, Sister Pauline. It was a custom in France to place the Christmas gift for the children inside their shoes on the eve of Christmas Day. Celine, have you not stopped this practice? Teresa is no longer a baby. Speak softly, Father. Teresa might hear us. You know she gets upset easily. But Celine, this pampering need to stop. I know that she want to join the convent. How is she going to survive the strict rules of the convent? If she's pampered like this. Meanwhile, Teresa was listening to the entire conversation. On a normal occasion, she would have been shattered, but God was slowly transforming her for a noble cause. Jesus arrived into her heart and did what Teresa could not. When Celine realized that Teresa had heard what they said, she thought Teresa would be in tears in a few seconds. Oh, Teresa, were you listening to our conversation? Yes, Celine. Huh? Are you not upset at what Dad said? No, not at all. I think God is working His ways so that I can join the convent. When Teresa's father approached the church authorities to allow her into the Carmelite, they initially refused. They said that she was too young to enter the convent. However, Teresa's mind was made up. She couldn't bear to wait, as she felt that God was calling her to enter a nun's life. She was so determined that she traveled to the Vatican to meet the Pope personally. The Pope was slightly taken aback to hear such an unusual request from a young girl. Well, my child, do what the superiors decide. In a few days, Teresa got the required permissions to join the Carmelite convent. Convent life was not without hardships. It was cold, and the accommodations were basic, and it was nothing like Teresa had imagined before. Jesus, I finally joined the convent. Thank you for helping me. Her father suffered a series of strokes that left him affected not only physically but mentally. When he began hallucinating and grabbed for a gun as if going into battle, he was taken to an asylum for the insane. Horrified, Teresa learned of the humiliation of the father she adored and admired, and of the gossip and pity of their so-called friends. As a cloistered nun, she couldn't even visit her father. Teresa realized that she would never be able to attain sainthood unless there was a miracle. So she decided to do little deeds to make others happy around her. She took every chance to sacrifice, no matter how small it would seem. She smiled at the sisters she didn't like. She ate everything that was given without complaining, so that she was often given the worst leftovers. Oh no! Can't you be a little more careful, Teresa? Do you know how expensive that waste was? Mother, please forgive me. I will not repeat this. Hey, Teresa, why did you take the blame for my mistake? Don't worry, sister. That's all right. Teresa had poor health, and she was often bedridden. But she conversed with Jesus continuously, and in spite of her ill health, she wanted to attain sainthood by doing little things. She took her vows on 8th of September, 1890, and took the name as Teresa of Child Jesus. She wrote many letters to express her devotion to the Holy Face. One day, Teresa was called into the office of her sister Pauline. Did you call me, sister? Teresa, come, sit down. Hmm, I think I may have some bad news for you. Huh? What is it? I think I have been selected as the new prioress. Wow, that's such a wonderful news. But why are you looking so sad, sister? I'm coming to that. Don't worry. Tell me, what is it? Mm. Look, Teresa. Now that I have been elected as the prioress, everyone in the convent feels that we sisters will take over the convent. They think that we will push everyone to get what we want. I don't blame them, as there are four of us here in the convent now, and the convent strength is only about 20. Mm. That's true. I can understand their concerns. Now listen, Teresa. What I'm going to tell you now might hurt a bit, 
but it's only for the greater good. You will have to remain a novice. <laughs> That's all. Don't you realize how serious this is? This means that you will never be a fully professed nun, and you will always have to ask permission for everything you do. Hmm. I understand, sister. Don't worry. Thank you, sister. You don't realize how great your sacrifice is. Thank you. Teresa didn't worry at all about spending her remaining life as a novice at the convent. All she wanted to do was little deeds that would make others happy. After a few years, one day while she was working, she started coughing up blood. <coughs> But she kept working and never told anyone about her sickness. It took almost a year for everyone to realize that Teresa was sick. Why didn't you tell me? I didn't want you to leave your duties. I'm sorry, Teresa. I should have never asked for all those sacrifice from you. That's all right, sister. Teresa, I want you to write your memoirs on a book for me. Can you do that? Memoirs? But who's going to read that? You don't worry about that. Just do like I told you. With your life, I want to show to the world that performing your duties with great love is much more important to God. All right, sister. And as her sister told her, she started writing letters documenting her thoughts and encouraging others to pray to God. Uncle Francis, it is really surprising that Teresa of Child Jesus did not do any extraordinary deeds, but she was still made the patron saint. You are absolutely right, Joan. She had not traveled anywhere from the convent to spread the good news, nor did she perform any miracles. But then, how was she made the patron saint of missions? Teresa had assisted the Society of Foreign Missions in the role of a spiritual sister. She had written letters to them encouraging, consoling, and praying for their missions through her little ways. Uncle Francis, what was the cause for her early death? On the eve of Good Friday in 1896, after the prayers she went to bed, she was suffering from tuberculosis, which was not curable during those times. <sighs> oh, most loving Jesus, I know that my time on earth has come to an end. Teresa died on the 30th of September 1897, and her last words were, "My God, I love you." One nun commented that there was nothing to say about Teresa, but Pauline put together Teresa's writings and heavily edited them, unfortunately, and sent two thousand copies to other convents. But Teresa's little way of trusting in Jesus to make her holy and relying on small daily sacrifices instead of great deeds appealed to the thousands of Catholics and others who were trying to find holiness in ordinary lives. Uncle Francis, how old was she when she died? She died at a very young age of 24. But uncle, when were the parents of Saint Teresa declared saints? They were canonized together on 18th October 2015. So truly, the family of Saint Teresa of Lisieux is a family of saints. Yes, Teresa of Lisieux is one of the patron saints of the missions. Not because she ever went anywhere, but because of her special love of the missions and the prayers and letters she gave in support of missionaries. This is a reminder to all of us who feel we can do nothing that it is the little things that keep God's kingdom growing. That was such a wonderful story. I'm glad you liked it, Jim. That's all for today. I will tell you another story tomorrow. Goodbye, Uncle. Goodbye, kids. Saint Maria Faustina Kowalska of the Blessed Sacrament was born as Helena Kowalska 
in Glogowick, Lechia County, northwest of Lodz in Poland, on August 25, 1905. She was the third of ten children to a poor and religious family. After her baptism in the nearby parish church of Swaniswarki, she was given the name Helena. During her childhood, she distinguished herself by acts of devotion, her love for prayer, hard work, obedience, and a tremendous sensitivity to human misery. Faustina first felt a calling to the religious life when she was just seven years old. Despite completing only three years of schooling, in her diary, she clearly described what she wanted to achieve in a simple, precise manner without any ambiguity. It was in the seventh year of my life, for the first time, I heard God's voice in my soul. That is, an invitation to a more perfect life. But I was not always obedient to the call to grace. I came across no one who would have explained these things to me. After finishing her schooling, Faustina went immediately to join a convent. Instead, at 16 years old, Faustina became a housekeeper to help her parents and support herself. At the age of 16, she left her family home for the nearby city of Alexandro and then moved to Lodz, where she worked as a servant to support herself and to help her parents. During this period, the desire to join a convent was gradually growing inside her. Since her parents were against it, young Helena tried to postpone God's call. Years later, she wrote about this in her book. Once I was at a dance with one of my sisters, and while everybody was having a good time, my soul was experiencing internal torments. As I began to dance, I suddenly saw Jesus at my side. Jesus racked with pain, stripped of his clothing, covered with wounds, who spoke these words to me. How long shall I suffer, and how long will you keep deceiving me? At that moment, the charming music stopped, and any company vanished from my sight. There remained Jesus and I. I took a seat by my dear sister, pretending to have a headache to hide what had taken place in my soul. After a while, I slipped out unnoticed, leaving my sister and all my companions behind and made my way to the Cathedral of St. Stanislaus Kost. It was almost twilight. There was only a few people in the cathedral. Paying no attention to what had happened around me, I fell prostrate before the Blessed Sacrament and begged the Lord to be good enough to allow me to understand what I should do next. Then I heard these words, Go at once to Warsaw. You will enter a convent there. I rose from prayer, came home, and took care of things that needed to be settled. As best I could, I confided to my sister what took place within my soul. I told her to say goodbye to her parents, and thus, in one dress, with no other belongings, I arrived in Warsaw. When she arrived in Warsaw, she entered St. James Church in Warsaw, the first church she came across, and attended Mass. While in Warsaw, Faustina approached many different convents, but was turned away every time. She was judged on her appearances, and sometimes rejected for poverty. Finally, the Mother Superior for the Congregation of the Sisters of Our Lady of Mercy decided to take in Faustina on the condition that she could pay for her own religious habit. Working as a housekeeper, Faustina began to save her money and make deposits to the convent. On April 30th, 1926, at 20 years old, she finally received her habit and took the religious name of Sister Maria Faustina of the Blessed Sacrament. And in 1928, she took her first religious vows as a nun. In her diary, she described her feelings when joining the convent. It seemed to me that I had stepped into the life of paradise. A single prayer was bursting forth from my heart, one of thanksgiving. 
She was assigned to work in various houses of the congregation, spending the longest periods of time in Krakow, Plock, and Vilnius, working as a cook, gardener, and doorkeeper. Her rigorous lifestyle and exhausting fasting, which she was undertaking even before joining the congregation, weakened her body to a great extent. Soon after, she began to show the first signs of her illness and was sent away to rest. Several months later, Faustina returned to the convent. In 1931, Faustina was visited again by Lord Jesus. He presented himself as the King of Divine Mercy, wearing a white garment with red and pale rays coming from his heart. In her diary, Faustina wrote, In the evening, when I was in my cell, I became aware of the Lord Jesus clothed in a white garment. One hand was raised in blessing, the other was touching the garment at the breast. From the opening of the garment at the breast, there came forth two large rays, one red and the other pale. In silence, I gazed intently at the Lord. My soul was overwhelmed with fear, but also with great joy. After a while, Jesus said to me, Paint an image according to the pattern you see, with the inscription, Jesus, I trust in you. Even though she didn't know how to paint, St. Faustina attempted to sketch the vision of Christ with charcoal and canvas, but she didn't have much success. She turned to our Lord for help, and He told her that He would send her visible help with the task of creating the image. Shortly afterward, she was sent to a convent in Vilnius to work as a gardener. While at Vilnius, she met Father Michael Sapako, who had been recently appointed as a confessor for the nuns in the convent. He listened to Faustina's story about the vision of divine mercy and her desire to create an image of Christ. Father Sapako was concerned about Faustina. Father Sapako insisted she be evaluated by a psychiatrist. Faustina passed all of the required tests and was determined sane, leading Sapako to support her religious efforts. Sapako encouraged her to start keeping a diary and to record all of her conversations with Jesus. He then contacted the artist Eugene Kazimierowski, who painted the first image of divine mercy for St. Faustina. In the painting, Christ is shown raising his hand in blessing, while also pointing to the two rays that flow from his chest. One of the rays is red, which symbolizes the blood of Jesus. The white ray symbolizes the water that saves souls. The entire image brings to mind charity, forgiveness, and God's incredible love for his children. During the following year, Faustina attempted to set up a new congregation for divine mercy, but was reminded that she was perpetually vowed to her current order and sent back to Warsaw. Her entire life, in imitation of Christ's, was to be a sacrifice, a life lived for others. At the divine Lord's request, she willingly offered her personal sufferings in union with Him to atone for the sins of others. In her daily life, she was to become a doer of mercy, bringing joy and peace to others. And by writing about God's mercy, she was to encourage others to trust in Him and thus prepare the world for His coming again. In 1936, Faustina fell ill again. She moved to the sanatorium in Prodnik, Krakow, and continued to spend most of her life in prayer. Her special devotion to Mary Immaculate and to the sacraments of Eucharist and Reconciliation gave her the strength to bear all her sufferings as an offering to God on behalf of the Church and those in special need, especially great sinners and the dying. In 1937, 
the first holy cards with the Divine Mercy image were created, and Faustina provided instructions for the Novena of Divine Mercy, which she reported as a message from Jesus. Throughout the rest of 1937, the Divine Mercy image continued to be promoted and grow in popularity. During the final years of her life, her health deteriorated significantly. She developed tuberculosis, which attacked her lungs and gastrointestinal tract. As a result, she underwent two periods of hospital treatment, each lasting a few months. Physically ravaged, but spiritually entirely mature, being mystically united with God, she died in Krakow Lajwaniki on October 5, 1938, in the odor of sanctity, having lived for only 33 years, including 13 years of monastic life. The message of mercy that Sister Faustina received is now being spread throughout the world. Her diary, Divine Mercy in My Soul, has become the handbook for devotion to the Divine Mercy. After St. Faustina's death, the Divine Mercy devotion spread quickly. By 1951, over 150 religious centers dedicated to Divine Mercy could be found in Poland. Let me tell you the story of a unique and mysterious Eucharist miracle the saint experienced. In a passage dated in the late 1920s, she shares a number of fascinating stories about her personal encounters with Jesus Christ, both in apparitions and in the Eucharist. One amazing story stands out that took place while she was praying in her Covenants Chapel. One day Jesus said to me, I am going to leave this house because there are things here which displease me. Then, something strange happened. The Eucharist left the tabernacle on its own and flew to her. And the host came out of the tabernacle and came to rest in my hand. The Blessed Eucharist, which is Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity, had miraculously started moving around the room and landed in her hand. Was she scared? Confused? Well, here is how the saint responded. I, with joy, placed it back in the tabernacle. But the Eucharist kept moving. This was repeated a second time, and I did the same thing. Despite this, it happened a third time. After the third time, though, something new happened. The host was transformed into the living Lord Jesus, who said to me, I will stay here no longer. Now Jesus had told her twice that he wanted her to leave, and she has prevented him multiple times. After this second declaration, wouldn't you think a saint would relent? Not this saint. She confidently told our Lord, that she just wouldn't let him leave the convent. She explains, At this, a powerful love for Jesus rose up in my soul. I answered, And I, I will not let you leave this house, Jesus. And again, Jesus disappeared while the host remained in my hands. Once again, I put it back in the chalice and closed it up in the tabernacle. This time, it was Jesus who relented. And Jesus stayed with us. But the Polish nun didn't leave it at that. Jesus had said he wanted to leave due to things here which displease me. So, in a very saintly manner, she took it on herself to try to atone for the problems. And that's all she says about the encounter. What an incredible story of a wonderfully personal and intimate encounter with our Lord. St. Faustina Kowalska was beatified on April 18, 1993, and canonized on April 30, 2000, both by Pope St. John Paul II. Her feast day is celebrated on October 5th, and she is the patron saint of mercy.
Saint Margaret of Scotland, who lived from 1045 to 1093, wife of the Scottish King Malcolm III, introduced important religious reforms into Scotland and was a civilizing agent in the social life of that country. Information about the early life of Saint Margaret is based on tradition. For her later years, there is a dependable life of Saint Margaret written by her confessor, Turgot. Saint Margaret of Scotland was a truly liberated woman in the sense that she was free to be herself. For her, that meant freedom to love God and serve others. Not Scottish by birth, Margaret was the daughter of Princess Agatha of Hungary and the Anglo-Saxon Prince Edward Atheling. When she was 12, she was sent to the English court of Edward the Confessor and further educated. Margaret's father returned to England at the request of the king, and he brought his family with him. He was to become the successor to the throne. However, Edward died immediately after the family arrived, leaving Margaret fatherless. Soon, war broke out. In 1066, at the Battle of Hastings, the Anglo-Saxon English lost to the Norman French. Margaret's family fled from William the Conqueror after his victory. Her widowed mother set out to take her children north to Northumbria. Tradition says Agatha decided to leave Northumbria and return to the continent, but her family's ship got caught in a storm. The storm drove their ship even more north to Scotland, where they were shipwrecked in 1068. The spot they landed on is now known as St. Margaret's Hope. The Scottish king, Malcolm III, invited the family to stay at his castle until their boat could be repaired. During their visit, Malcolm fell in love with Margaret. He asked her to marry him. Margaret asked Malcolm for time to think about this decision. Although she too was falling in love, she always believed that God was calling her to be a nun. Margaret asked her mother for advice. She talked to a priest about how she could know what God wanted her to do. The priest told her to pray and that God would guide her to make the right decision. After spending time alone in prayer, Margaret knew that God was calling her to a life of service as a wife and mother. Malcolm and Margaret were soon married in his castle. During their marriage, Margaret and Malcolm grew more deeply in love. Malcolm was good-hearted, but rough and uncultured, as was his country. Because of Malcolm's love for Margaret, she was able to soften his temper and polish his manners. He left all domestic affairs to her and often consulted her in state matters. Together they prayed, fed the hungry, and offered a powerful example of living faith in action. Malcolm saw that Christ truly dwelt in her heart. Margaret helped him become a virtuous, gracious leader. As the Queen of Scotland, she encouraged Malcolm to educate the Scottish children. Together, they worked to establish schools in the country. She read to him from the Bible and encouraged monasteries to open in Scotland. Margaret was not only a queen, but a mother. She and Malcolm had six sons and two daughters. Margaret tried to improve her adopted country by promoting the arts and education. Her impact in Scotland led her to being referred to as the Pearl of Scotland. She constantly worked to aid the poor in Scotland. She nursed the sick. 
She even brought homeless people into the castle. She encouraged people to live a devout life, grow in prayer, and grow in holiness. Malcolm helped her to build churches, including the Abbey of Dunfermline, where a relic of the true cross is kept. Although she was very much caught up in the affairs of the household and country, she remained detached from the world. She was well known for her deep life of prayer and piety. She set aside specific times for prayer and to read scripture. She didn't eat often and slept very little so she would have more time for her devotions. She gathered women together to pray and to study the scriptures. She and her husband would go to church during Lent and Advent. On the way home, they would wash the feet of poor people in need and help them. At home, Margaret fed nine orphans who were brought to her daily. She was then said to sit them upon her knee and feed them. War broke out and Malcolm engaged the English near Alnwick. He was killed in battle along with Edward, his son and heir. Margaret, already weakened due to illness, was not told of her husband's and her son's death for fear of worsening her condition. Upon her deathbed, Margaret clasped her hands around a black cross, which she held in deep veneration. This was thought to be part of the true cross. Eventually, Margaret learned of the death of her husband and son. Whether due to illness or the news of her loss, she died four days after Malcolm. Margaret and Malcolm were buried together under the high altar of a monastery. Devotion to the Holy Queen began soon after her death, as she was canonized in 1250. Her children are believed to be primarily responsible for two centuries of progress and peace in Scotland. Merciful God, you gave the Holy Queen Margaret of Scotland great love for the poor. Lend your ear to the intercessions of this holy woman and help us to live after her example, so that your goodness and mercy becomes visible in today's world. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Few men have merited the title, The Great, and even fewer women have. Saint Gertrude is one of them. She was a virgin, mystic, and Benedictine abbess, and was called by our Lord himself, My Chosen Lily. Although nothing much is known of this German woman's family background, it is widely accepted that she was entrusted to the sisters of Helfta Abbey to be educated when she was five years old. It is also possible that she entered the monastery school as an orphan. Mechtilda, the younger sister of the abbess Gertrude, who was later canonized a saint, took care of young Gertrude. Gertrude and Mechtilda had a strong bond that only grew deeper with time, allowing Mechtilda to have a great influence over Gertrude. The high walls surrounding the cloister broadened the young girl's mind instead of confining it. The nuns there were known for their thoroughness in training and study, which only helped the intellectual gifts that God had bestowed on Gertrude. She devoted herself to her studies and received an education in many different subjects. At a very young age, Gertrude was both fluent in Latin and very familiar with scripture and works from the fathers of the church, including Augustine. She also discovered Christ in the monastery and the beauty of living for him and with him 
in the intimacy of his love. The Benedictine sisters soon realized that she was favored by heaven. One nun who suffered the torment of terrible temptations had a dream in which she was told to ask Gertrude for help and to ask for her prayers. As soon as Gertrude began to pray for her, the temptations ceased. After several years, Gertrude moved from the monastery school to the novitiate, taking the veil and becoming a nun. Gertrude, known for being charming and able to win people over, entered the Benedictine order at Helfte. In 1280, at the age of 24, she went through an inner crisis that lasted several weeks. She felt lonely, lost, and depressed. Her human plans disintegrated. This might have been the end of everything, but instead, it was a new beginning. At the age of 25, Sister Gertrude had a jarring spiritual experience, which would divide her life dramatically into two halves, before and after. Before, Gertrude was a faithful nun, but overly interested in secular writers and knowledge for knowledge's sake. After, she buried her head in scripture, read widely in the Fathers of the Church, and she always felt as if she was being watched by the eyes of Christ. She devoted herself to personal prayer and meditation and began writing spiritual treaties for the benefit of her monastic sisters. Her fame grew. She became one of the great mystics of the 13th century. The monastery was soon filled with people in search of her words, comfort, and guidance. She had great influence because the reputation of her holiness and her visions attracted many people. Since her conversion, she had become the confidant of Jesus, who revealed to her the infinite love of his divine heart and charged her to spread it among human beings with love for the suffering and for sinners. Gertrude's conversations with Jesus prompted her to write pages that would bring souls to him. More than three centuries before the visions of St. Margaret Mary Alacoque in France, St. Gertrude had visions of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. In one vision, St. John the Evangelist placed Gertrude close to Christ's wounded side, where she could feel his pulsating heart. Gertrude asked John why he did not reveal the mystery of Christ's loving heart to mankind. St. John responded that his duty was only to reveal the very person of Christ. Together with her friend and teacher, she practiced a spirituality called nuptial mysticism. That is, she came to see herself as the bride of Christ. Gertrude composed her spiritual diaries at the express command of her spouse, Christ. She embraced charity for both rich and poor. Gertrude's health began to deteriorate, but she continued to only show her love for the Lord. By this time, Gertrude's mystical union with her spouse, our Lord Jesus, was so ardent and intimate that even the thought of sudden death could not disturb her. In fact, she expressed her desire to join her spouse. One Good Friday, images of Christ's wounds, stigmata, appeared on Gertrude's body. For a time, these painful marks bled seven times a day. Word of Gertrude's stigmata spread throughout the country, and many arrived to meet her. So many people interrupted her prayerful solitude in order to view the phenomena. Gertrude asked God to do something about it. So the bleeding stopped, but the marks and pain remained with her for the rest of her life. For the next 18 years, Gertrude suffered patiently every day. Throughout her life, Gertrude produced numerous writings although only a few still exist today. 
One of her longest surviving works is Legatus Memorialis Abundantiae Divinae Paetatis, the Herald of Divine Love. Her other standing works include her collection of spiritual exercises and Precis Gertrudiane, Gertrudian Prayers. Gertrude's life became daily more supernatural, and often she experienced ecstasies in which she not only enjoyed the company of our Lord, but His Holy Mother as well. Even her favorite saints came to visit her. On November 17, 1301, Gertrude passed away a virgin and joined her bridegroom forever. Apart from her writings, few details of Gertrude's life are known. She left virtually no footprint besides her life of quiet fidelity as a contemplative nun. Like John the Baptist, she decreased so the Lord could increase. Eternal Father, I offer the most precious blood of thy divine Son, Jesus, in union with the masses said throughout the world today, for all the holy souls in purgatory, for sinners everywhere, for sinners in the universal church, those within my own home and within my family. Amen. May 15th is the feast day of St. Dymphna, a young woman of great courage. She is the patroness of the mentally and emotionally ill and other nervous disorders. How did this come to pass? Let us learn the incredible and heart-wrenching story of St. Dymphna today. The first thing to say is that the story of St. Dymphna, also spelled Dymphna with a Y and Dymphna with an I, is shrouded in mystery and uncertainty, but there is no question of a tradition of invoking her for the mentally ill. The earliest historical account of veneration of the saint dates from the middle of the 13th century in Belgium, where the Irish Saint Dymphna died and was buried in the 7th century. The author of the account, a canon of the Church of Saint Aubert at Cambrai, wrote A Life of the Saint commissioned by the Bishop of Cambrai, Guy I. He states expressly that the basis for his biography was oral tradition. Saint Dymphna was born in 7th century Ireland to an Irish king or warlord named Damon, who was a pagan. Her mother was very beautiful and a Christian. Dymphna's mother imparted the Christian faith to her daughter and had her secretly baptized against her father's wishes. When Dymphna was 14, she consecrated herself to Christ and took a vow of chastity. Her mother tragically died while St. Dymphna was only a teenager. Damon loved his wife dearly, and after her death, his mental health declined greatly. His moody silences pushed him on the verge of mental collapse. His courtiers suggested he consider a second marriage. The king agreed on condition that his new bride should look exactly like his former one. His envoys went far afield in search of the woman he desired. They searched for a queen in distant lands for many months, but their quest proved fruitless. Then one of them had a brilliant idea. Why shouldn't the king marry his daughter, the living likeness of her mother? The king was appalled at first. Then, when the courtiers pressed him again, he too thought this was a good idea. He then began to desire his daughter, who bore a strong resemblance to her mother. Dymphna, who had made a vow of virginity before God, was horrified by her father's proposal and adamantly refused. The king was very angry at her. To escape the king's inevitable outrage over her rejection, Dymphna fled the kingdom. 
she was accompanied by her confessor, Father Gera Bernis, as well as faithful servants from her father's court. On landing in Antwerp, on the coast of Belgium, they looked around for a place to stay. In the little village of Giel, they settled near a shrine dedicated to St. Martin of Tours. According to one tradition, Dymphna built a hospital using the money she brought from her palace. Dymphna dedicated herself to the care of the impoverished and sick. The mentally ill, in particular, found refuge in her kindness. And it wasn't long before Dymphna developed a reputation for her charity. Unfortunately, her good deeds were not to go unpunished. Her father's men were searching throughout the land for her. After a few months, the spies tracked her down as she used the coins she got from Ireland. They reported this to Damon, who then went to Belgium to try to take Dymphna back to Ireland. He had Jera Bernus decapitated on sight, a martyrdom for which the old priest would later be canonized. He once again proclaimed his romantic love for his daughter and begged her to return to Ireland as his wife. When this approach failed, he tried threats and insults, but these two left Dymphna unmoved. She would not change her mind, staying true to her vow of virginity and refusal to enter an incestuous relationship. In a fit of rage, he beheaded her, his own daughter. According to tradition, she was only 15 years old when she died. The people of the town buried the two bodies in a cave near Giel. Word of her sacrifice spread quickly, and it wasn't long before people began making pilgrimages to Giel to visit the place where the Christian girl laid down her life. She was declared patroness of those with mental problems because of the great anguish her father's mental affliction caused. St. Dymphna's story should give all of us courage and strength, especially that through her God has provided a powerful patroness for those suffering from mental and emotional disorders. like St. Teresa of Avila and St. Catherine of Genoa contributed significantly to the Catholic Reformation. But in the 16th century church, perhaps no woman responded more creatively to the need for reform than St. Angela Marici. She built communities that trained single women in Christian living and provided them a secure place of honor in their local societies. Angela Marici, foundress of the Ursuline Sisters, was born in the small Italian town of Desenzano on the shore of Lake Garda in 1474. She was the youngest among the four children born to Giovanni Marici and Caterina Biancosi. Giovanni would gather the family around the fire each evening for sharing and storytelling. Sometimes he would read from the Bible, and sometimes he would tell them a story of their favorite saints, heroes and martyrs who had generously served God. Giovanni also taught his students to read. He wanted them to learn as much as they could, since there was no chance for them to go to school. The children grew up happily in the farm. Angela loved her sister very much. As a young girl, Angela lost in succession her sister and both of her parents. At the age of 16, after the death of her parents and her sister, she moved to Salo on Lake Garda to live with her uncle Biancosi. Angela obviously quite distraught over her loss, 
prayed day and night to God for some sign that her family was in heaven. One midday during harvest, Angela was alone in the fields when she experienced a life-changing vision. The heavens opened and angels and young women came toward her, singing a melody surrounded by light. One of the young girls was Angela's sister. She told her sister Angela that one day she would gather a group of women like herself. These women would become companions to one another, forming a company to do special work for the church. As the vision disappeared, Angela knelt down and thanked Jesus for her sister's happiness. Since then, she has been known as a saint thanks to her spiritual life and her capacity to understand and help people. Angela found that she really wanted more time to be alone, to become more aware of God's presence and action in her life. When she was 18 years old, following the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Angela became a Franciscan tertiary. She wore the simple robe of the Franciscans and a white veil and was called Sister Angela. She attended Mass early each morning, then joined the workers in the fields. The people respected her as Sister Angela and were happy she had come home they realized that they had a special person living among them. In 1516, Angela came to live in the town of Brescia, Italy. Here, she became a friend of the wealthy nobles of the day and a servant of the poor and suffering by the night. She spent her days in prayer and fasting and service. Her reputation spread, and her advice was sought by both young and old, rich and poor, religious and secular, male and female. But still, Angela had not brought her vision to fruition. In 1524, Angela embarked on a journey to the Holy Land. This six-month pilgrimage was fraught with all kinds of risks and dangers, including pirates, storms, and sailing off course. A year later, she went to Rome, and during the two weeks she spent in Rome, she had a personal visit with the Pope. Angela returned to Brescia, which had become a haven for refugees from the many wars then racking Italy. There, she gathered around her a group of women who looked to Angela as an inspirational leader and as a model of apostolic charity. It was these women, many of them daughters of the wealthy, some orphans themselves, who formed the beginning of Angela's company of St. Ursula. Angela named her company after St. Ursula because she regarded her as a model of consecrated virginity. Angela and her original company worked out details of the rule of prayer and promises and practices by which they were to live. The Ursuline sisters opened schools and orphanages and worked hard in pursuit of St. Angela's mission to elevate family life through the Christian education of future wives and mothers. Living in the first part of the 16th century, St. Angela was far ahead of her time. Nowadays, you can see nuns teaching in schools around the world. But nuns did not always do this. It had to start with someone, and that someone was St. Angela. St. Angela sought to change society one woman at a time by infusing every home with Christian virtue emanating from the heart of the woman who ran it. She trained future wives, mothers, and educators in their youth when they were still able to be formed. In 1580, Charles Borromeo, Bishop of Milan, 
inspired by the work of the Ursulines in Brescia, encouraged the foundation of Ursuline houses in all the dioceses in northern Italy. The bishop also encouraged the Ursulines to live together in community rather than in their own homes. Angela did not live long after the foundation of the company. Her great gift comes to us in her writings. These are called counsels and legacies and contain so much of Angela's wisdom and insights. Over the years, the Ursulines have flourished as the oldest and one of the most respected of the church's teaching orders. On January 27, 1540, Angela died in her small room close by the church of St. Afra. There was nothing extraordinary about her death. She went quietly home. St. Angela Marici was a woman of strength, a woman of vision, but most of all, a woman of God. She truly lived and worked as the Ursuline motto declares, Soli Deo Gloria, for the glory of God alone. St. Angela Marici, you were generous and joyful in answering God's call and you happily shared the gifts you had been given. When you recognized the need for education, you overcame obstacles and prejudice by your prayer and your commitment to those living in poverty. Open our eyes to the needs of others. Remind us that Jesus calls us to serve our sisters and brothers and to bring joy to those around us. Amen.